Amen. Good morning again. It's great to see all of you, all of your beautiful faces, and I want to welcome our guests today. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, it's great to see you as well. I want to start a weird start for a Resurrection Sunday, but let me ask you this question about two words that I think if, uh, if most of us here, they might tremble according to what follows, these two words. And these two words are, what if, okay? What if. And according to what follows these two words, it might have huge implications on you. So imagine with me, consider with me, what if the doctor said that you have few months to live? It's trembling. It's fearful. What if you lose your family? Oh, what if you lose your job and all your money? There are things that we don't want to consider, that they have huge implications on us that we just don't want to imagine happening, right? Let me tell you that these examples that I told you are less horrific and should cause less fear to you than hearing what if there is no resurrection? What if there is no resurrection? Maybe you haven't thought about this before, about this before but let me tell you, if there is no resurrection, we are in trouble. We are hopeless, and we will speak about it today. Why I want to speak about this, and why I'm saying this, because I believe that the whole world, this week and next week, looks upon the cross, right? And looks upon the death of Jesus on the cross. But if we want to just try to compare between how much people focus on the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection, I believe that they focus a lot on his death, more than his resurrection. His death is more interesting. It's more fascinating to people than his resurrection. They do focus on it. They do speak of it. We say Christ is risen. But let me ask you, in the past few weeks, how many times have you thought about the resurrection in comparison to the death of Jesus? We all think of his death much more than his resurrection. But the Apostle Paul in Romans 5, verse 10, listen to these words. He says, For if, we, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, much more, more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's much more, as if, as if Paul is saying the resurrection is more important. I'm sure it's not more important, it's equal. But this is why I want to look with you at the importance of resurrection today. How much it is crucial and essential to our Christian life. Paul the Apostle is the one who asked this question. What if there is no resurrection? It's not me. So if you want to blame me about the beginning of the sermon, please don't blame him. I'm just following his words. What if there is no resurrection? This is a sensitive question. Maybe, maybe you would say, Brother Eli, you could have chosen another topic today. But let me tell you, I believe that when we think about this topic, it pushes us to the edge and put us temporarily, just for a short time, for maybe 30 minutes, under this possibility. But I believe it will stamp in our minds and hearts forever the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. This is why let me read to you a few verses from the letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, chapter 15, from verses 12 to 19. First Corinthians, if you want to open your Bibles with me, chapter 15 and verses 12 
2.19. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Then those also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. What if there is no resurrection. Paul is saying, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, and then he speaks about the consequences, about the implications. It looks like that some people at that city, at Corinth, were believing that there is no resurrection. And Paul is saying, if there is no resurrection, then Christ didn't rise. And if Christ didn't rise, let me tell you five implications that would blow your mind. Literally. You know that while building an ark, if someone here is an engineer or works in construction, if you want to build an ark, there is a stone that is the center, that is the foundation. That is, if we can put the photo, the first one, that if you remove this stone, all the building will fall apart. This is it. This stone in the middle, if you remove it, all the ark will fall. There's a game called Jenga. I don't know if you know it. Jenga is a game with uh, all the youth know it. Okay, so not the, 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 the people a little bit older. Okay, so Jenga is made out of blocks, okay, equal weight. Blocks that are, have equal weight where it is built in such a shape that you have to take one piece and then put it on the top, okay? And then another person, his turn, he takes another piece and he puts it on the top. And what will happen is that you will have a huge tower that becomes standing on one stone or two stones. That if you just touch the tower, it will all fall apart. There's a world record for someone who had 1,500 pieces of Jenga, this, the second photo, and it's all built on one stone, one stone. What would happen if you take that one stone in the bottom? Everything will fall. If there is no resurrection, everything falls. If there is no resurrection, we are doomed. If there is no resurrection, we are dead. Everything literally falls. This is why. Let us answer this question today. What if there is no resurrection? And the first answer and the first horrible implication is that the Bible is a big lie. The Bible would be all of it, a big lie, if there is no resurrection. Listen to what Paul said. He said, our preaching is vain, in verse 14. In verse 15, he says, moreover, we are found, we are even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Paul is saying, we are been found. We are been found is a is a vocabulary that is used in legal issues. So Paul is saying, as if we were taken to court and we have witnessed, but our witness is false. We are liars. We have been found false witnesses, liars, if we are saying that the father raised the son, but he did not. We are liars. 
simply, Paul is saying, we have preached and witnessed to you something that is a lie. All the speech about a man's sin and the possibility of getting saved through a mediator and through a substitutionary sacrifice, it's all a lie. Why? Because Christ died, and that's the end of the story. He's in the grave. He's dead. He did not rise. Man is sinful, and there is simply no hope for him. Only if Christ did not rise. And if the preaching of the apostles in the New Testament is a lie about this, how can we trust them in the other things, right? If Paul could lie about the resurrection, how can I trust him in what he said other than the resurrection? In the Old Testament, also it is written about the resurrection, and it is said in Psalm 16. It's a prophecy about the resurrection. Psalm 16, 8 to 10. Listen to this. To these verses, I have set the Lord continually before me. Because he is at, at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It's as if the Messiah is speaking, Jesus is speaking. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor you will allow your Holy One to undergo decay. This is a prophecy about Jesus and his resurrection. And if the Old Testament could lie about one thing, then other things might be a lie only if Christ didn't rise. Let me tell you one more thing that you might say, Brother Eli, you're pushing us to the edge. Yes, I am. Jesus would be a liar if there is no resurrection. That's true. Listen to what he said to the disciples, Luke 9. He said to them, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So if there is no resurrection, then Jesus lied. And if Jesus lied in one thing, how can I trust him in other things? The gospel is a lie. The Bible, all the Bible, it's all a big lie, a fabricated story, if Christ didn't rise, if there is no resurrection. 1 Corinthians, it's the same chapter. Listen to what Paul says about the gospel. What is the gospel? What are the good news? Listen to him speaking and opening up this chapter and saying, I now make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word why, which I preached to you unless you believed in vain. So what's the gospel? Here it is. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then he speaks, and says to whom Christ appeared. And then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve, and then to more than 500 brethren at one time. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and then last of all to me. This is the gospel. I mean, he's speaking just two things about the death and the burial, but then he's continuing to speak about the resurrection because the resurrection is a very important part in the gospel. If there is no resurrection... The Bible is a big lie. Only if Christ didn't rise. The second implication. What if there is no resurrection? Our faith is useless. Our faith is empty. It's useless. Listen to what he says, verse 14 and 17. He says, your faith also is vain. It's empty. 17, and if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. You know that faith is the assurance, right? It's the trust, the, the conviction in something that you have in something or in someone. So it's as if you are, you are going to jump off a cliff of a mountain because of, the, because of a beast that is running after you. And you just think, you just think that there is a rope that is tied to you. And that it will save you. 
but what you think of and what you trust in is vain, is empty. You don't have a rope. You will just jump and crash. You will hit the ground. You will die. There's no rope. There's no savior because he's dead. He's in the grave. How can you be saved even though you have faith? Why? It is said that it's not about the amount of faith we have, but the object of our faith. Have you heard that before? For example, if you are in your apartment, I don't know why I'm giving all these horrible examples today, but this is the question. The apartment is burning, okay? And you have to jump. And you have a big faith, a huge faith, that there is a net waiting for you down if you jump. No matter how much faith you have, if there is no net, you will die. Right? So it's not about the amount of faith you have. It's about the object of, our, of your faith. It's about if there is a net. If there is a strong net with people holding it and just waiting you to save you from death. So if Christ didn't rise from the dead, even though you have faith, it's empty. It's useless. Because Christ is dead only if he did not rise from the dead. Listen to what John MacArthur says about the death of Jesus and the Father accepting that sacrifice. The good news of the gospel is Christ died for our sins, and the satisfaction for our sins was made in full, and God was pleased, and therefore God raised him from the dead to show that he had sufficiently provided the atonement for sin. That's the good news. So if, if there is no resurrection, that God, then God did not accept that sacrifice. Then this sacrifice is not sufficient for our sins. Then Jesus is still in the grave. Our faith is useless. When we read in Hebrews 11, we read about the heroes of faith then these are not heroes because their faith is useless only if Christ didn't rise, only if there is no resurrection. The third implication, so the Bible is a big lie if there is no resurrection, if Christ didn't rise. Your faith, our faith is useless and we are not saved. We are not saved if there is no resurrection. This is why he's saying to you, to you and to me in the beginning of this chapter I now make to you known, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved. And if this gospel doesn't have resurrection, you are not saved. Sin wins. Death wins. Imagine this with me. Death wins. Sin wins. In the same chapter... Paul says in verse 25, For he must train until he put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. But if Christ didn't rise, who wins? Death. The last enemy is not conquered. Sin wins. Death wins. When we die, that's it. That's the end. There's no hope. There's no hope. We are not saved. We are not saved. We are not forgiven. We are not made right with God. We are not justified. We are not given life only if Christ didn't rise. Only if there is no resurrection. The fourth implications quickly. If there is no resurrection, everyone who believed in Christ is in hell. That's true. Only if. Christ didn't rise. Verse 18. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Do you know what perished mean? It means destroyed, abolished, ruined, lost, eternally doomed. Can you imagine that? All our relatives, all our friends who died in Christ are in hell. All those whom we know who lived for Christ are in hell. Paul and Peter is in hell. 
The apostles are in hell if there's no resurrection. Moses, Abraham, Noah, they are all in hell. All the saints in the Old Testament, all the saints in the New Testament are in hell only if Christ didn't rise, if there is no resurrection. Steve Lawson says, without the resurrection of Christ, the church is just a social club going to hell. That's true. Only if there is no resurrection. And the last implication, and I don't mean to insult anyone, but the last implication, according to Paul, is that we are miserable fools. If there is no resurrection, we are miserable fools. This is what he says in verse 19. If we hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Everyone who believed in the Savior who is to come or everyone who believed in Christ is a fool. You are building your life on Christ. You are sacrificing everything for Him. You are not loving the world, not loving sin, hating sin, hating the world and what it gives to you. You are preaching the gospel. You are teaching your children the word of God. You are spending time in prayer and studying the word and doing all these things and all these things are all in vain. Then you are and I am a fool. Then let all the preaching stop. Let all the churches shut down. If there is no resurrection, if Christ did not rise, if Christ didn't rise, if there is no resurrection, the Bible is a big lie. Our faith is useless. We are not saved. Everyone who believed in Christ is in hell, and we are all miserable fools. As if you have a table, and you're holding everything on it, and then you pull the cover. What happens? Everything falls. That's what happens if there is no resurrection. But let us read together verse 20. After Paul spoke all these things, in verse 20 he says, read with me. But now, but now, I cannot hear you. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. I know that you got discouraged. I know that I disappointed you. But let me tell you, there are good news today that Christ has been raised from the dead. Therefore, let me tell you what are the implications. The Bible is true. All the Bible, from the first page to the last page, it's true. Your faith is not useless. It's useful. You are saved because Christ rose from the dead. Everyone who believed in Christ through history is with him now, not in hell. And you are not a miserable fool. You are a wise man and a wise woman if you are building your life on Christ. Why? Because now Christ has been raised. Let me, lead, let me read to you the, the account of Luke in Chapter 24, it says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. They thought he's still there. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified, and bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Jesus is risen. Jesus is not dead. Jesus is not in the tomb. The empty tomb shows that. Shows that. 
the, the testimony of the apostles shows that. The clothing that were lying there show that. The rolled stone shows that. The church that has been built 2,000 years ago and it's still growing shows that there is resurrection. The Bible is true. Your faith is useful. We are saved. Everyone who believed in Christ is with him now. And we are wise men and women because we are building our life on him. Do you believe that Christ has risen? If you do so and you believe that he died for your sins and you believe that he was raised to give you justification, to justify you, to, com to complete, to perfect his salvation, then you are saved. Listen to these words in Romans 10, 8 to 11. And if anyone here has no assurance of salvation, has not yet come to Christ, please hear these words with me and look with me on the cross and on the empty grave. What does it say? The word is near you. You are hearing God's word today. You are hearing the good word, the good news. In your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. If you come to Christ with a repenting heart, knowing that you are a sinner, that you need him, there is no other mediator, there is no other savior but him. If you believe that he died, but he rose from the dead, he will save you, he will give you life. He will give you life. He gave me life. He gave many here life. And he still gives life. Let me end with you with a beautiful thing that John the Apostle records. John 20, verse 3 to 7. And we will end with this reading. John 20, speaking about the resurrection and the empty tomb. Listen to these words carefully. So Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Simon Peter also came, following him and entered the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings, the same thing, everything that was Jesus, Jesus was wrapped with, it was what? Lying there. Okay? It was lying there. And the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So Peter and the other disciples, disciple, they went and they saw all the linen wrappings, okay? They were lying there. But the face cloth was not with the linen wrappings. It was folded and it was put aside. And there is a question that we should ask. Why does God want us, wants us to know this? Why did John speak about this faith? face cloth. Why didn't he speak generally about the linen wrappings and that's it? Two reasons. First, to let us know that the resurrection didn't happen in a hurry. Jesus wasn't trying to escape from the soldiers, okay, so that they don't catch him or arrest him. It happened slowly. To fold something, to fold a napkin, it, need, it needs time, right? And if you want to fold a napkin, you don't do it. You go, right? So if you fold a napkin, you are not in a hurry. The resurrection happened because it's Jesus, the Lord of the living and the dead. But there is another reason. 
And to know the reason, we have to know the Jewish tradition at that time. And every Jewish boy would know that. When a master, a Jewish master, wants to have dinner, his servant prepares the table, okay? And he pre prepares it in a very neat way. All the plates are in place, the food, everything is on the table. And when the master comes and sits on the table and starts eating, if the master took his napkin and he stood so, and he wiped his mouth and his beard and then he took the napkin and tossed it, he compressed the napkin and th threw it on the table, then the servant would know that the master has finished. So he can take the table. He can clean the table. But if the master stood up, maybe wiped his mouth, but he folded the napkin and put it beside the plate, the servant would not dare touch the table because the master is saying, I am coming back. Jesus folded the napkin saying, I am coming back. I didn't finish. This is not the end of the story. I am coming back. He is risen, and he is coming back. Christ is risen, and he, amen, and he is coming back. This is why let me read to you the last verse that Paul, before this beautiful truth and the glorious resurrection, listen to what he sa says to you and to me what this resurrection should have an implication on you now, on your life now. The last verse, therefore, at the end, as a conclusion, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Jesus has risen. Be steadfast, immovable. Have an immovable faith. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always serving him. Always sharing the gospel. Always serving one another. Knowing that your toil, toil is not in vain in the Lord. Because Jesus is risen. And he is coming back. Let us pray. If you are here with us today and you have still not come to this glorious, victorious Savior, I call on you today to come to him. Jesus died on the cross on behalf of sinners to take away our sins. And he was raised from the dead to justify you and to justify me. And if you come today with a believing heart in him, with a repenting heart of your sin, because you cannot come to him and keep living in sin, no. Either you are dead with him to sin, or you are still living in sin. So if you come today and give him your sins, I guarantee you that he will give you his righteousness. And I can prove it to you because he did that to me and to many. He was raised from the dead and he's coming back again. And we do not know the time. Heavenly Father, what a glorious truth. What a glorious reality it is, the resurrection of your son. You are the one who raises from the dead. You have the power over death. Thank you, Lord, for saving us from our sins. Thank you, Lord, for saving us from our death and giving us life just like you gave life to our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Help us to live in the light of resurrection. Help us to live as people who were raised from their sins. Help us to be dead, to live in a way that as if we are dead to sin, but we are alive in Christ. Lord Jesus, we call you to come, and we are waiting for your coming. And may you find us faithful as people as, and, and as a church for your coming. And in your name we pray. Amen.